Thank you, Gary. I appreciate it. And I want to echo one of the first things that Dr. DeWeese said, that, you know, thank you guys for coming. I'm up against Meg Stone. I told Virginia, I'm thinking about skipping mine and going to see hers. So I appreciate all you guys uh, showing up. But I got to follow Brad, and, you know, he's smarter than I am, better looking than I am, and his voice sounds better, too. So I, it's a tough act to follow. Uh, so what we're talking about is recovery and fatigue, fatigue monitoring. So the first thing that I want to go over is that the body has got only like one bank account. Stress is systemic. It doesn't matter what the stressor is, it affects the body the same way. That is why it's called the stress syndrome. There is not a different bank for strength training, for conditioning, for class, for relationship, for family. Everything pulls from the same source, that same bank account of sorts. You know, at Missouri, we have a thing we call money in the bank, and you know, everything takes money out, and some things put money back in. But all stressors then, they're going to be affecting training. They're going to be affecting training. It could be you had a break up with your girlfriend, you got a test coming up, et cetera. All these things affect training. You know, at the NCAA, we're limited to eight hours a week that we can have with them in the weight room. There's 168 hours in the week. So we focus a lot on those eight hours, all that we can. But you got to take into account, too, those other 160 hours, man, they matter, too. They matter, too. Now, monitoring. This enab uh, enables you to account for the other 100, 160 hours. So you can't do it without monitoring. Now, this slide is one from uh, something that we've got currently in review. It's the effects of stress on injury. Now, these black bars here, they're representing uh, high physical stress. That's training camp. The gray bars, these are test weeks. You can see, and the white bars are non-test weeks. So you can see the effects just quite simply from this graph of academic stress on injury. Whenever we had a high academic stress week, we had a lot more injuries. We had a lot more injuries. Now, before we get going, one of the things I want to talk about is a little bit of perspective. We've got internal and external loading. Okay, these two things are different. The internal loading, that is the body's response to the exercise. So it's not what you did, it's how you responded to it. External loading is the dosage of exercise that's placed upon the individual. So for instance, you know, we've talked about a lot of different technologies at this conference. There have been a lot of different talks that they've been doing it. Uh, external loading, catapult, GP sport, those would be great examples of external loading. Internal loading would be things like heart rate. It's not what you did, it's the body's response to it. So you've got to realize what you're looking at and what you're dealing at and make sure you're applying it to the right means, okay? Now, one of the things that I've heard, heard and talked with, with people in the past is like, man, monitoring, it sounds great, but I can't do it. We don't have a budget. It's like, do you have a pencil and paper? That'll cost you like two bucks, right? There's lots of free ways to do monitoring. You could do RPE training loads, questionnaires, and morning resting heart rate. Those are going to be the first thing, three things that we're going to go over. Now, RPE, what is RPE? Rating perceived exertion. Now, RPE has been found to be an accurate means of judging training intensity. You know, I've got a slide coming up that's going to demonstrate that. With the RPE, it simply doesn't matter what scale you use, as long as you use the same scale every time. It's just how hard was the workout for that person. Now, you look at a lot of the older research saying that you had to wait 30 minutes post. Well, I think it was last month or two months ago, a study that came out that showed that immediately after the session, you had the same result as you did 10 minutes later, as you did 30 minutes later. There is no need to wait. The numbers are going to be the same. It might actually, in fact, be a little bit better. You can catch them about two minutes afterwards where they just catch their breath, caught their breath, they just got done stretching, etc. You're probably going to get the best data possible then because they remember, they know exactly how hard that was. It doesn't take them long. Now that was done with athletes. With the general population, it might still be 30 minutes. I'm, I'm not sure, to be completely honest. But now, with the RPE, we can go a step more than that. We can find what's called a training load, an RPE training load. All that simply is, is the number that you had of the RPE that was giving, and the time. You multiply those out, and it gives you a number. Right, so let's say that I had uh, 30 minutes out of five, right? That would give me a 150. Okay, well, what if I do a, a shorter workout? Let's just say it's 10 minutes, but it's a 10. 
It's 100. It's a lot closer to that 30-minute workout, but I only had 10 minutes. So it's a, just a simple way to sum and quantify how hard things work. It's a, you don't have polar heart rate training system? That's fine. You can use RPE. It's simple. It's quick. It's easy. It costs you a piece of paper and a pencil. One of the ways that I've done it, that I know people are like, well, that's great. Well, how do you do it? One of the ways that I've done it that I tried this summer, and it worked out great, was with, the, uh, with my soccer team. I had them bring their phones out to the track. We did through, went through the whole workout. We stretched. And I said, hey, guys, go grab your phones. Email me your response. Don't talk to each other. I don't want you to respond. I don't want Gary to be basing his, what he's telling me off of what Adam thought it was. So I don't let them talk to each other. I just have them email me directly. And one of the things about emailing, me, emailing it to me is it eliminates that human element. You see, most people, they're always trying to give you the answer that they think you want. That they think you want. Not what it really was. So to eliminate that, you take the human element, human element out of it. They're not telling me. They're simply responding by email. That takes out some of the human element. Also, you've got to coach them up and instruct them. You don't want them to try and guess what you're thinking it is. You've got to make sure that they understand the purpose behind it. It's like, hey, guys, you know, I'm just trying to see what you thought. I don't care what I think. I know what I think it's supposed to be. I care what you think, how you thought it was. So instruct them to do that. You'll get better data. Now, monitor over time. So you, whenever you're monitoring over time, you can tell. You do the same workout one day, you get a art training load of 120. You do the exact same workout three weeks later, their RPE training load was like 190. Well, you know something's going on. You know something's going on. There were additional stressors that affected that athlete to cause that workout, that perceived exertion to be higher, even though it was the same external load, the same training stimulus imposed on, now it's harder. They're most likely have gone into overtraining. Uh, another thing that it does is it checks if the coach rates it and rates the individual players as well. It's not, it uh, compares what the coaches think versus what the athletes feel. And this is actually really great for new coaches. Uh, we did this all season with the soccer team. And we had every single coach do the RPE of the training session. And it was interesting to me. The older coaches with a lot of experience, they were right on. You know, the athletes thought it was a seven, they thought it was a seven. The younger coaches tended to either way over or way underestimate. They just simply didn't know how hard the workout was. Over time, and they started comparing everything and seeing this is what I thought versus what they thought. Okay, all right, they started to get better at it, and they had a quicker learning curve to realize how much stimulus, how much load, how much stress they were putting on that athlete. Now, this chart, okay, this chart is from uh, a Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research article uh, by Clark et al., Basically what they did was they took Canadian football and they did session RPE and they correlated it with a polar trimp. Trimp just means training impulse, right? That's how they come up with their loading score. And also the Edwards training load. And you can see that for most of the people, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. The mean .78 for free, I'll take that. I'll take that for free. Is the polar a little bit better? Yeah. If you've got no money, is it $6,000 or $12,000 better? No. This is better than nothing. Is it the top of the line? Absolutely not. Is it something that you can do and not cost you anything? Absolutely. Now, resting heart rate. Resting heart rate is something that's been around forever, and a lot of people forget about it. First thing that they do whenever they wake up is they track their heart rate. Have them send it to you, or you could even use some other different programs. We'll talk about that later. The old school stuff, Poliquin, and some other things that I've read, if the resting heart rate increases two beats per minute, it could indicate that overtraining has taken place. That's for most team sports. Now, with endurance sports, you've actually got to watch out for both ways. For both ways. If you see a two beat decrease overnight, that's actually indicating overtraining for them. A lot of people are like, well, don't I want that as a response for my training, is I want my heart rate to decrease over time, right? Yes, you should see about a one beat per minute decline whenever you see that. Whenever you see two or more, 
on an instantaneous overnight, that indicates that they've got symptoms of uh, parasympathetic overtraining. If you read the German literature, I believe they call it basodaic overtraining. But there's, you've got two parts of the autonomic nervous system. You've got the sympathetic, you've got the parasympathetic. You can overtrain either nervous system because those are, you're drawn from both in sport. Now, questionnaires. Okay, I put semi-free up here. Some are, some aren't. Some are free, some are not. There's a website that Jeremy Gentles, while he was at ETSU, put together called www.sportably.com. Now, this website is amazing. You can put your RPEs in here. You can have them go and fill out the questionnaires. You can, uh, there are so many things that you can do with this website. It's great, and it is completely free. You can set your athletes up with accounts on there. You won't ever have to collect anything by pen and paper. Now, with this website, he's got some of the more traditionally expensive questionnaires. Why do I say traditionally expensive? Because with a rescue, you're supposed to have a licensed sports psychologist or licensed counseling psychologist to give that, and they charge like 20 bucks a pop. Well, on this website, they've got it for free. They've got it for free. The rescue 76 and 126, or it's 82 and 126. Uh, the rescue, that's recovery stress questionnaire, it's actually developed specifically for athletes. Now with the questionnaires, the other wellness data, you're looking for changes. You're looking for changes over time, just like with RPE. Now these things, uh, the POMS, the pro, uh, profile of mood state, you're looking for changes. Everything is about mood, okay? Uh, training vigor has been found the one thing that's been consistent with overtraining throughout all the literature. Test cortisol, there's been different standards that happen in the literature. They say some think that it's, uh, you know, this rate, X ratio, others think it's Y. Heart rate variability, there's, now it has gotten a lot better with the technology that we have, but some earlier studies showed that it didn't work, resting heart rate, uh, counter movement jumps, etc. The one thing that's been stable among all of it is questionnaires. It's questionnaires, it's mood. Now you're looking for the changes again. You're not trying to change the person. You're not trying to change the person. You're simply seeing, are they in a bad mood today? Do they have low vigor? That's what you're looking for. Is there a set number? No. If the person starts dropping off, it's a good sign that something's going on. You might want to talk to them. Maybe it's something that you could help the athlete out with. Maybe their parents are getting divorced. Maybe their girlfriend just left them. Maybe you need to help this person get into counseling. Maybe there's an issue like that. Now, here is an example of the different diagnostic tools. Now we see up on top, and basically all I'm trying to show is that this stuff is legit, right? This is a, stuff, a study by Niederhoff et al. Look at general stress, general recovery, sports-specific stress, sports-specific recovery. This is just simply a questionnaire and what they thought. On the left column, we see non-functional overreaching. On the right, uh, in the middle, sorry, recovering non-functional overreaching. And then the control, the group that didn't do anything. So basically what you want to see is Trending in general stress, you want to see it lower. General recovery, you want to see higher. Sports-specific stress, it is what it is. But you want to see the recovery moving on up. As we see, whenever they were overtrained, they had a lower number for the recovery. Whenever they were recovering, the number improved. Palms, we're looking for, palms is like a golf, low score wins, right? Low score wins. You want the lowest number possible for that individual. You want to see that it trends down. If it trends up, you're either overtraining or something else is going on with that athlete. Remember, it's systemic. Uh, also, you see down at the, the bottom, reaction time. Uh, as somebody is becoming overtrained, they actually react slower. And we can see that from this right here. Okay? We see the 850 is much slower than the 730. 680 is, I'm sorry, 820 is slower than 680. Uh, interestingly enough, whenever they were recovering from non-functional overtraining, this might be part of the supercompensation, they, their uh, reaction time was actually much faster. And this kind of goes in a little bit with what Dr. DeWeese was just talking about with the periodization, right? The proper periodization. You've got to put in a stimulus, back off, and then you might, you'll have a delayed transformation effect. The reaction time is showing this. Now, reaction time, like we just said, it's been found to be uh, uh, assign a training status. Now there's some very expensive ones and there's some free ones. Old school ruler drop test. 
You hold a ruler up just above the person's index finger and thumb, you drop it, they react to catch it. I would go with the metric system because it's simpler numbers, but whatever that number is, that's what you get. Maybe one day that they're getting it at one centimeter, the next day they're getting it at two centimeters. You know whenever they're getting it at two centimeters, they're overtrained or something else is going on. Uh, vision tests, things like the, the DynaVision, uh, that cave that I don't know if they're in the ex exhibition hall or not. I haven't made my way all the way around there yet, but I'm going to after this. There's a lot of different reaction speed tests and vision tests that help to determine about overtraining. Now, this is just simply looking at the reaction times, and we're looking at uh, the, whenever I first looked at this, I got confused. This is as a percentage of their initial trial. So anytime that they were in non-functional overtraining, their reaction times were much slower, up to, what is that, 127, 128%. 127 or 128% slower, showing that the reaction time was off, they're overtrained. They're not gonna be able to perform optimally. It's like, well, with all this fatigue stuff, all this monitoring, you're like, hey, this is great, but what, what, dif what difference does that make? Well, guys, this could be the difference between winning games and losing games. Having your guys on point or having your athletes sluggish. And if nothing else, at least you know what's going on. You know what to expect. Now the hand dynamometer and finger tap test, I put these in here uh, together. I actually have found a lot more emphasis and a lot better results with the hand dynamometer than I have the finger tap test. It seems to be a little bit more sensitive. Okay, we'll go over each one of these uh, in just one moment. Now grip strength testing. If you are dealing with non-trained athletes, grip strength has got a great overall relationship to total body strength. It's a perfect relationship with non-trained individuals. With trained individuals, it changes a little bit. You might have a guy that benches 600 and a guy that benches 200. And the guy that benches 200 has got a bigger grip. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You're looking for the changes. You're going up and down. With the hand dynamometer, you can, ah, oops. With the hand dynamometer, however you do it, you always do it the same. If you do elbow bend at 90, fine. If you do elbow all the way, you know, arm out straight, fine. Just do it the same way every time. Do it the same way every time. Hold it for about three seconds. Uh, test first thing that you can. Do it after a rest. You don't want to see the athlete whenever they get done conditioning and then you're testing them. You don't want to do that because they're already going to be, be fatigued, right? You want to get them ideally first thing in the morning. You don't get them first thing in the morning. Get them before you get started. And again, you're charting and you're looking for trends that may lead to injury. Uh, it's great actually for pitchers in baseball or softball. Uh, It's great because the pitchers in, the, uh, in both sports have got so much impact with the ball and they're doing so many different things with their hands. If you start to see their grip strength drop off, their pitches are gonna be bad. So you know that it's, you need to take a little bit more time for them to be able to, to pitch again or do some additional recovery methods, which we're not gonna go into because I know Dr. Marcello did a heck of a job on it. With the hand dynamometer, here's a little trick that I did. I kind of cheated the system. Uh, one of the first years that I had the, the soccer team, the coach was, you know, wanting to make sure that we were doing the best things possible. And the first, one of the first years that I had them, our vertical jump numbers went down. So he started freaking out a little bit. And I'm like, well, you know what? I want to make the coach happy. I want to make the coach happy. So what I did was I cheated the system. Whenever they had a great number on their hand dynamometer, I pulled out the vertical jump mat. They were jumping three, four, five inches higher than they were on any other given day. Why? Because their nervous system was excited. Remember, the peripheral nervous system, okay, that's made up of all the spinal nerves and everything that's not the brain and the, spi uh, brain and the actual spinal cord itself. It ends in the hands and it ends in the feet. So doing grip strength is a fairly decent means of testing that peripheral nervous system. Is it as good as check my level, that finished product? I don't know. I haven't actually used it. I know about it, know people who have used it, but I do know that this works. Because every time that they hit a good number on the hand dynamometer, I had them jump. They jumped great. Any time that they weren't up on their hand dynamometer, their jumps were either the same or even low. And every time that they were weak on the grip, their jumps were low. Now, the way that I did this, I know that Poliquin was talking about the two kilograms. 
I like stats a little bit more than that. I'm not the greatest statistician in the world, but I use the three methods, the three measures of central tendency, mean, median, and mode. Okay, so mean is just the average, median is the middle number, and mode is the most common. And I would look at standard deviations away from that, either up or down. Now, if I was a, uh, a standard deviation up from baseline, I would look at doing power on that day. Or if I was getting ready to do a testing period, I would go ahead and strength test them on that day. It'd be a good day for you, you'll get some good numbers. Whenever it's at baseline, I would be doing the regular resistance training, regular strength training. A standard deviation down, it's a good day to do bodybuilding. Now, one of the things that I keep hearing from people is that, well, this monitoring, all you're gonna do is have guys tell you that they're not gonna go train today. That's crap. If you're somebody who thinks that, guys, we've gotta get educated. It doesn't, they're not saying at all to not train and just rest and recover, unless it says, like on the Omega Wave, it actually says, go see a doctor, which I've had a few times. Not the greatest thing in the world to see in the first thing in the morning. You need to go see a doctor. Eh, crap. But it's good stuff. Uh, two standard deviations up or down, they're likely uh, getting sick. But going back to the point, I forgot where I was. I, I'm sorry, I got off on a tangent. Basically, you have got to learn that it mean, doesn't mean don't train. It means you might need to change up your training. Okay? The person is blown today. They need to do a higher volume, lower intensity work like bodybuilding. Oh, gee, you know, calisthenics would be great for that day, too. And guess what those things do? They help to recover the parasympathetic nervous system. They help you to shift gears. Okay? They help you to shift back to parasympathetic. If you th guys think about this, uh, what was the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system's function? Right? It was that rest and digest or rest and recover, however you wanted to say it. You've got to shift the people back into that, like Dr. Marcello was talking about with the static stretching. But the one thing that I did notice that I want to point out is whenever there were two standard deviations up or down, the athletes were getting sick. The next two days, they, they were always sick. So if there were two standard deviations up, I'd have them train, they'd have the workout of their life, get some great PR, and I'd lose them for a week. So the, what I started doing was just two standard deviations up or down, I'd send them to the training room. Uh, the finger tap test, it's nice and cheap. It's an app now. There's a lot of apps out there for it. Uh, this is, I think it's good because of that. It's very, very accessible. Everybody's got a smartphone. Uh, essentially, you're doing the same thing. You get a baseline, and you are comparing it standard deviation-wise back to the baseline. Uh, there's a finger tap app called CNS Tap Test for $1.99. Two bucks, it's worth two bucks. The hand dynamometer is much more accurate, but you're looking at uh, a couple hundred bucks to get one, which isn't, isn't bad at all, really. Now, we can move into things that are much more expensive with monitoring. We're going to talk about heart rate monitoring, GPS, and velocity monitoring. And hopefully we'll have enough time to actually touch on sleep as well. Now, with heart rate monitoring, one of the things that we've used a lot is the team systems. We've got the Polar Team 2 system. You can utilize real-time data, and even if you don't utilize the real-time data, it'll give you that uh, TRIMP, that training impulse, the training load score, as an internal load measuring. It does everything by TRIMP, okay? What is TRIMP? Well, the numbers uh, are based off of time spent in different percentage zones on your heart rate, okay? Now, one thing that I've noticed about it is that you actually need to get real max heart rate and real resting heart rate numbers. Now, the Team 2 is default set to the, the Carvonin method using heart rate reserve. So for a while, I was just, do I didn't even realize that and I had it set as the default 60 beats per minute for the resting heart rate, and I was doing the real max. What do I mean by real max? Anytime that there's a session and you see that their heart rate hits a higher number, that's their new heart rate max. Simple. You'll start out with most of them on a conditioning test, then you can adjust them as the year goes on. It doesn't take a whole heck of a lot of time at all. But I was getting some weird numbers. There were some people that looked like it was really easy for them, but it was really actually hard. And the reason I think was is because uh, we didn't test their resting heart rate initially. So the Carvonin method uses both max and resting. On the people that it was right on, it's because we were lucky. And I would always rather be right than lucky. So we retested the resting heart rate. How we actually did that was 
uh, we had everybody come in. We, they were instructed what to do first thing in the morning. We went at 6 o'clock in the morning. They came in. They put on their chest straps. They laid down for about 10 minutes. Then we turned the system on, gathered data for five minutes. By then, most of them were asleep, and we were getting a good resting heart rate number. Is it perfect? No. Another way that you could do it is have them test their heart rate themselves, take their pulse first thing in the morning, and send it to you like we did on the resting heart rate. A couple issues that you might run into there uh, are some people can't count, and some people can't tell time, and some people can't multiply. So I always would rather be right than lucky, uh, me personally. Now, wow, that's really small. Okay. But what we're showing here is actually some of my data that I, I took from last summer. You can see I collected both RPE and the exertion score. So we've got the different players. Here's their RPEs, their loads, because it was a 90-minute session. Their exertion score that was found by Polar. Uh, we took out outliers. Some people always run hot. Some people always run cold. So if we were trying to look for the mean for the day, we're going to eliminate that data, that outlier data, so that we've got everything that's pretty consistent. And we saw that for the, uh, I cut off the mean. But we can, that will help you find the means and the standard deviations to see how hard the workout really was, to see how hard it really was for a whole. So then you've got two numbers to back each other up. You have got the RPE score, and you've also got the heart rate score. Now, another way of using heart rate monitoring, uh, a couple of recent studies using soccer and I believe rugby we're using the Yo-Yo Intermittent Recovery 1 and Yo-Yo Intermittent Recovery 2. Not both in the same day, they were using either one. That is just simply a conditioning test. It's what they had people do was the first four minutes of it. It's very, very submaximal. Even me and my fat butt can go through four minutes of this, I think. So it's very submaximal. And what you're looking for there is you're looking for the drop-off. You're looking for the drop-off at one and two minutes. Having the team system, you simply drop a marker. You drop a marker as soon as they finish, and you drop a marker at one minute, and you drop a marker at two minutes. You're going to look at their heart rate recovery, the amount of drop-off, not the max, what they got to, not the bottom-out number. You're looking for just simply the difference between those two. And the difference between those two is heart rate recovery, and that tell if you are not recovering, from a submaximal exercise, that means you're stuck in, stuck in the sympathetic state, and that means you're overtrained. You're overtrained. We need to eat, find something, you know, additional recovery methods like we talked about. Uh, the one thing about the, this is whatever conditioning test that you use, if it's yo-yo intermittent recovery one, two, 30, 15, et cetera, just keep using that test. Why would you use that test over and over again? Well, because they start to get used to it. They get used to the beeps, and then you can kind of take out that little, oh, crap, it's a conditioning test time. Well, they're used to it, at least those first four minutes of it. So it kind of takes away the scariness of the test. Now, with this, you do it once a week. Do it once a week as a part of warm-up. So what I would do is take the soccer team out. We would be doing this as our warm-up. They might do some dynamic stuff at the start. We go through four minutes of the yo-yo intermittent recovery one. They take a two-minute water break where they're standing there drinking water, drop our pen, we're good to go. We've got that data. It didn't cost us any extra time. It's about trying to get maximizing your time, trying, being parsimonious, getting the most amount of information from the least amount of input. We didn't do anything extra. It was a part of practice. It was part of their warm-up. Now, velocity tracking. How could I get up and give a talk and not talk about velocity, right? There's uh, Sanchez, out of Sanchez Medina's lab, I think the researcher was Guerra Badia. I'm pretty sure. Uh, if anybody wants it, they can email me later on. I'll find that, that study and send it to them. But there was a high correlation between percentage of 1RM and the corresponding velocity. So if you came in, who in here has had a great day in the weight room where everything felt light? Only a third of us. Not all of us like to lift. Dude, we're Strength and Conditioning Association. How many people have gone into the weight room and they felt like they couldn't even, 135 felt heavy? I had that this morning. Well, there is a high correlation between percentage of 1RM and velocity. So if you move 80%, let's go 60%, you move 60% at about 0.8 meters per second. 
No matter what your max is that day, 0.8 meters per second is always going to be 60%. So you're taking a lot of the guesswork out. So actually right now off of some exercises, the max can be predicted by velocity. In this same uh, study, they have got a prediction equation for bench press on the Smith machine to predict 1RM. I think there might even have been squat on a Smith machine. We're, I'm working on some stuff right now that is going to be looking at it with a free barbell. Hopefully we'll get it figured out here very soon. So by realizing that the max can be predicted by velocity for many exercises, we know that if the load at that given velocity fluctuates, it drops way down, the individual is probably overtrained. They can't move that weight, we've got to, do the, uh, we've got to back off. One of the things that we've done at Missouri is a lot of our in-season programming for football we've done by velocity. And that helps us to use the right load for a guy who gets, who's a third teamer, built like me, might play 10 snaps throughout the whole season, versus the starter who's getting 80, 90 snaps a game. The guy who's getting 80 snaps a game, well, that stressor of the game and that stressor of practice, they don't have as much in the bank. So we make sure that we use the appropriate load for them. Whereas somebody like me, who's got no athleticism in their body whatsoever, I mean, obviously, I would be using a heavier load because that's my main stressor. Now, one of the things that's been done, uh, my good friend Carl Valley has been talking about this for a while, is doing squat jumps within the workout as a measure of readiness and looking at the peak power number that occurs from that. A lot of these systems that are coming out now, like Gym Aware, they actually do data, they, they collect the data for you. You push on there and you select the person, that data is automatically stored in the cloud. They would start out with one or two sets of five or 10 squat jumps, whatever it is, you do the same thing every time, and you would look for the peak power. And use the same load, 40 kilos, something super light, something everybody can do, no matter how bad they feel, they can put a 25 pound plate or 10 kilo plate on each side and do five or 10 squat jumps. And you look at that peak power number, is it up, is it down? then we know if we need to adjust training at all. The key is to do it at the same load. You don't look at the peak power at 95 pounds, you know, uh, uh, 40 kilos one day, 80 kilos the next, 150 the next. You've always got to get with the same load, okay, so that you're always comparing apples to apples. Now, this is demonstrating what we were just talking about with the strength training. This is actually from Ladin Ivanovic over in, uh, now he's with Qatar. Uh, this is a study that he studied. This is a review paper that included some of his own data uh, in the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association's journal uh, earlier this year. We can see that this dotted line right here, this indicates the pre-tested 1RM. What they did in their testing session, this is what he got on a 1RM. Now, he, did a, uh, he does a velocity profile for each person, so he knows the percentage of 1RM versus the exact velocity for each person. That's a lot of work, but that's what he did, and that's what he based this off of with his uh, rugby players. So he comes in here on this day. He's way up. He's like 20 kilos up, 40 kilos up. No, 20. I can't read. He's way up. Second day, he's way up. Third day that they come in and train, he's almost at baseline. Now maybe something happened, maybe his parents died, don't know, but he's way down. Now what would happen if we use this 160 kilogram load as the training load, as the max, whenever his actual 1RM that day was 140? There's a good chance we would have hurt him in the weight room that day. It was simply too heavy for him, it was too heavy for him to deal with. He's got other stressors that are gone on. Maybe it's the game, maybe it's family life, maybe it's something else that has affected him. His 1RM is way off. By using velocity, we can track that. We know where they're at. Following up from that, they rebounded back to normal. Oops. Up higher, came back lower. But we can see over the course of the season, there's good days and bad days. There's good days and bad days. On the days whenever he was right around his pre-tested 1RM, we were lucky that day. We were lucky that we had the right weight on there. I don't like being lucky, I like being right. Also, one of the things that people have done before and, uh, is testing with the counter-movement jump, doing that daily, weekly, et cetera. 
this simply is a, a test showing, uh, I believe they use the force plate on this. They're looking at the peak power in watts. They, look at, they did a one simple, extremely intense workout. I can't remember what it was, but it was something like 20 set to 1 RM or something like that. It was ridiculous, so it was going to blow you up. Their baseline was 65.1 uh, watts per, ki uh, per kilogram. Right as soon as they were done with that workout, it was 62.8, so well below baseline. The fatigue had shown up. The neuromuscular fatigue had shown up. 24 hours post, they're back to 63.9. 72 hours post, they haven't even returned to baseline yet. They're 64.7. Are they close? Yeah. They've gotten close, but they're not fully recovered yet from that one training session. So counter movement jump is something else that you could use. And this is for, I should include this slide up in the earlier part. I'm not that great with the mouse. I was doing it on my laptop. There wasn't even a mouse. It's that little pad thing. I, somehow I moved it all the way back here. Uh, also, off of this previous study, we're looking at the rate of force development. They looked at that as well. If you look, the rate of force development is a function of time. Baseline is this nice, dark, solid line. Now, remember, rate of force development is how quickly you can produce force. You want that curve as far to the left as you can. Think back to that old Kramer slide from the Gatorade Sports Science Institute number 12 or 13, something like that. It was real early on, whenever he was talking about the explosive ballistic versus heavy resistance train and how heavy resistance train you produce force, more force overall, but with explosively ballistic train you produce more force in sport because it was much further to the left. Well, we want to see that force curve, that RFD curve, as far to the left as possible. At baseline, it was the furthest to the left of all of them because that neuromuscular fatigue had showed up. Now, what does this mean in sport? This means that they're a step slower. It means they can't hit as hard. It means they can't jump up as high to get the rebound. It means that if they're going to go from forehand to backhand, that they're slow and they might miss the ball. Their timing's going to be off. So simple vertical jump. And if you're wanting to know how to find uh, power and vertical jump, I got an article on Elite FTS that goes on about that. You know, this would be a whole talk in and of itself, which actually I gave at national conference. Now, talking more about this and just simply using some of the data that we've got and kind of showing with the, the overtraining. Uh, this is a study done by Moore and Fry whenever they were at University of Memphis. Basically, they took the team and they just followed them all through the spring. They had four different testing sessions where they looked at the one arm and clean and a lot of other exercises. They all followed the same ones. Uh, I just happened to choose the power clean over the rest of them. You can see at session one, this is baseline. Session two, this is whenever they got done with their strength training only. Session three and session four, they had started doing their uh, uh, county fair, mat drills, whatever the place happens to call it, where the football coaches come in and do the conditioning. The strength coach didn't change his plan at all. He didn't alter his intensity. He didn't alter his loads. He's like, man, I don't care what they're doing. I'm doing the same thing. I'm sticking with it. Well, we see what the result is. At three and four, they're weaker and weaker. And the, here's what the thing that I really want to point out. Week one and week four really aren't different. At the end of the semester, the power output they were doing from the clean was no different than if they didn't train at all. Think about that. Is your goal to make no gains? I hope not. I hope not. Monitoring is what will help you get these higher numbers. GPS. GPS is a term of external load like I spoke about before. Now simply put, it's the distance one has ran. This is great for practice, for games, etc. for the sports that it's allowed in. But for conditioning, it's not as important. Why would it not be as important for conditioning? You know the distances they ran. Get a calculator. My guys ran 24 100-yard sprints. Let's see what it says in the GPS. I won't even waste your time with the download. It's 2,400 yards. That's what their distance is. How fast did they run it? Well, you got the times that they ran. You got all that stuff. Now, while catapult is great, conditioning is not needed because everybody had that same external load. Now, whenever it's key is that whenever you get into the games and practices, some positions are going to be running more than others. I have a good friend of mine that, uh, thank you, that uh, is in, a, in the NFL, and he was showing one day that 
He, they had a couple of wide receivers that were hurt. So what did that do to everybody else? It dang near doubled their total yardage. So then he was able to go to the coach and be like, hey, we might want to do some more running drills. These guys are getting blown up because they're having to take all the reps. Uh, there's also some video software programs that will give you comparable data. I know that ProZone, uh, our soccer coaches use that. It gives them the yards that they ran, some different speed zones, et cetera, that, that go on with that. And the speed zones actually came from the Dwyer and Gabbett uh, study, so just like with the GPS. Uh, and the pro zone, I know, is overlayable with the GP Sport, which is pretty cool. So then you're getting you know, reinforced if that data was right or not, which it has got a very good uh, relationship. Uh, most beneficial in the practice and the games. Now, some GPS units have accelerometry, mag uh, magnetometers, and gyroscopes. Some do not. Whenever you've got the accelerometers, it can give you a lot of things that the other can't that are actually more impactful. Accelerations and decelerations. Okay, change the direction, impulse forces. And also, all that stuff added together will give you a simple external player load. So it just gives you one number that you can compare with the polar stuff. See, okay, I put in this external load, what happened to the body? Uh, the accelerations and decelerations. Man, this is really important because if I run 100 yards straight ahead, or I sprint 10, stop, sprint 10, stop, sprint 10, stop. Which one's going to be more stressful? The sprinting and stopping. Because you had to do the deceleration to absorb the force and reaccelerate. It's a much greater metabolic demand. So the GPS will help you know that. Uh, last up is the, the HRV, uh, heart rate variability. A lot of people are like thinking this is just weird stuff, you know, it's, it's uh, voodoo, et cetera. All it is is the mean root square of the RR interval. Okay, you look on the ECG, the R is the top point. It goes from one R to the next, that's the interval. If you've got a lot of variation, that's good. That means your heart is only working, it only beats whenever it needs to. Whenever you have no variation, that's bad. It's very metronome, it's just doing as little as it can to get by, because it's tired. Now this is a marker of the CNS fatigue. Remember the heart is innervated by a cranial nerve, which is the vagus nerve which also innervates the lungs, diaphragm, several other things. It's very, very sensitive. Uh, the thing with it is you need consistent data for the heart rate variability. Uh, Martin Boucher's recent study says that you need at least three sessions of HRV a week for you to find anything. Anything less than that is a hobby. Now with HRV, it's great to do first thing in the morning, okay? Because then you're getting the person's, what their system is at. Testing at different points in the day is not necessarily a bad thing. You're seeing how they've responded to different data, but you're not seeing how they, what their baseline is for that day. You're seeing what the response is from their alarm that went off, the person that cut them off on the way there, the caffeine they drank, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, interestingly enough, it can be thrown off by breathing, noise, et cetera. Everybody in here knows that they can control their own heart rate by slowing their breathing down. The lungs are innervated by the vagal nerve. One is going to be able to control the other since it's the, it's the same track, right? Uh, also, noise throws it off. Uh, I've done some HRV stuff before when we were doing it in a hallway that was really loud, and a lot of people were standing outside and making a lot of noise. Well, every time there was a loud bang or a loud scream by somebody, a loud laugh, the person's heart rate would spike. So it was showing that response. Now, sleep. Sleep is important. Okay? I know that we've had a couple other people talk about that. Now, sleep deprivation means decreased performance. There's uh, reaction time, increases, which is bad. Ground reactive force, decrease, etc. Sleep is when the recovery happens. Now, there's so many people that are pushing all these recovery means. They're doing Normatec, massage, uh, uh, the, the uh, cryogenic something or other, and the, uh, what's the thing whenever you sleep in the tube? Uh, hyperbaric chamber. They're doing all those different means, but they're not pushing sleep. Sleep is when you recover, guys. If there's no sleep, there's no recovery. You can't outspend poor sleep. It doesn't matter what else you're doing. If they're not sleeping, they're not recovering. Now, you can monitor sleep. You can do it for free. You can do a, a simple journal. This is actually on Sportably. They've got a category for sleep. You give self-reported number of hours. And you also do one of the things that your grandparents would ask you. 
I know the first, whenever I would go stay with my grandparents, the first thing they would always ask me whenever I woke up, came in for breakfast, is, how'd you sleep? Everybody knows what their quality of sleep was. If you simply give a scale of what that is, give it a one to five number with some different words, et cetera, you'll have some great data. You'll have some great data. And you'll see the effects of sleep on the other things, such as RPE, heart rate, et cetera. There's also expensive monitoring. There's rich watch, wrist watch accelerometers. There's things like the Jawbone Up, the Fitbit. Uh, there's apps on the phone. They can detect a lot of different things like time to fall asleep, wake, how many times you woke up during sleep, and sleep efficiency. How much you move means that if you move a lot, you're not in deep sleep. If you're dead still, you're sleeping, okay, in deep sleep. There is one caveat to that, especially if you're working with college or professional athletes. It can't tell if the deep sleep is because you're deep sleeping or because you're passed out drunk or something like that. So, now here's a study on sleep deprivation and grip strength, actually. The results, here's all this stuff up here. This just came out this month. Uh, I copied it in earlier. The results revealed that individuals who remain sleep deprived linearly uh, decrease linearly in the amount of their grip force. It was something like 15 or 20 percent. It was very high by one night of sleep deprivation. So grip strength is important, so is sleep. Okay, with monitoring frequency, if it's questionnaire, heart rate. Like I said, you've got to do it at least three times a week. Plu was talking about the questionnaire. Boucher was talking about the heart rate variability. And those are in my reference list. Uh, the velocity, do it on core lifts, do it weekly. Compare cleans to cleans, squats to squats, bench to bench, whatever. RPE, GPS, you're doing every session. Got to do every session, don't miss one. Okay, in conclusion, you can monitor fatigue and overtraining on any budget. There is no excuse for not monitoring. Guys, there's free ones. There's free versions. If you see a change in monitoring, it's telling you what's going on. It's telling you what the person's status is. And remember that readiness and fatigue are systemic. Okay, here's my contact info. My email, uh, phone, and Twitter. If you email me and I don't get back to you in two days, email me again, guys. I apologize. I've been getting about 250 emails a day lately. Stuff gets missed. Okay? I'm not being an a-hole or anything. I just didn't see it. Uh, and there's my Twitter feed. So acknowledgments. I'd like to thank Scott Caulfield and the NSCA uh, for bringing me out here, Pat Ivey and the Mizzou Strength and Conditioning staff for helping me to develop over my career, Mizzou PT and AT for letting me come out, Rick Perry was my first boss, gave me a shot, Joe Ken, Buddy Morris, Thomas Linsky, who if he's smart, he's in my, uh, Meg Stones right now. Uh, Louis Simmons, love him, hate him, he makes you think. My guy Cal Dietz, always keep me on my toes. Dave Tates and Mark Watts for giving me a platform with, for, to share my ideas at Lead FTS. Uh, and some people have greatly influenced me over the years. Dr. Andy Fry, Dr. Bill Kramer, Dr. Mike and Meg Stone, Dr. Jerry Mayhew. So here's my references. Uh, I'm out of time. I thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be here. I'll be around the rest of the day. <laughs>